but I still don't understand how they can affect our climate over hundreds of years. So I've arranged to meet an expert, someone who can tell me if these two factors really can explain climate changes like the medieval warm period and the little ice age. Well, if you think about it, um, the sun is providing all the energy we need for the climate system. Without the sun, we'd be pretty cold. Right. So if the uh, solar radiation is varying, then that's going to affect the climate. So the solar radiation varies every day or every week. What kind of time scale? Well, it's varying on all sorts of timescales, from minutes to thousands of years. But, of course, on the, for climate uh, concerns, we're interested mm. in the 11-year solar cycle and on cycles of about 200 years. But what about these volcanoes? I mean, I just read about Tambura in there. Went off in 1816 during the period of the Little Ice Age. How could that have actually helped make it even colder? Well, what happens is when you get a major volcanic eruption, it throws a whole load of material out into the atmosphere. And if it manages to reach the stratosphere, which is a very stable layer of the atmosphere at about 15 kilometres, it can stay there for months or even years. And while it's there, it's reflecting the sun's radiation back to space and so making the climate cooler. So it does seem possible that changes in the sun's output and huge volcanic eruptions have the power to create big shifts in past climate. But for me, that raises the big question. Could they also explain the current global warming? So these natural events, the change in the sun's output, the volcanic events, can they explain them? what's been going on with the warming trends now? Well, we think probably not. Oh. I mean, the sun has been varying and the volcanoes have been erupting, but if we look at the magnitudes of the forcing factors, um, they can't really explain recent warming. Jo reckons she can prove that the global warming we're experiencing now can't be caused by the same things that have driven climate change in the past. So I wanted to show you this uh, particular graph, which is showing the temperatures from uh, the year 1000 to 1850 okay. and it's showing the difference in temperature between the average. So the average here is zero and values above that are warmer and below that are cooler. And you see it wiggling along here until about 1850. All these temperatures, I mean thermometers weren't invented back here. How were they, they taken on these temperatures? That's right. Well, this involves painstaking work by a number of scientists using what are referred to as proxy measurements um, by using tree rings or ice core sediments, and the scientists can detect from those what the temperature at that time would have been in that location. Well, there's a lot, a lot of change in here, isn't it? That's the first thing. There's a lot more change than I thought, thought there would be. So this, if this is about 1,000 years ago, this is really warm. This is the medieval warm period, then, is it? This is sometimes referred to as the medieval warm period. So I, I suppose I can see a trend in here. It's just a bit warmer here. That's right. And it's a little oh, bit cooler along here in the 17th and 18th centuries, which is referred to as the Little Ice Age. So can solar variations and volcanic eruptions explain this? It can do a pretty good job. So if we ask a computer what it would predict over that period with just the solar and volcanic influences, mm -hmm. um, we'll come up with this blue curve here. And you can see that compared with the red curve, it's matching quite well. And also the size of the wiggles correspond quite well over this record. This cold period here, you know, rough guess 1815, is that... Is that that's the effects of Tumboro, that's oh, right. It is. It's a downward peak in temperature. Right. In oh, so, OK, so we can actually see it there. Look, it had a massive difference. So I finally have an explanation for all those climate changes I've seen through history like the medieval warm period and the Little Ice Age. So this, this takes us right up to about 150 years ago. That's right. So now what happened? Well, this is what the temperature records show. Wow. And um, this is measurements made from thermometers, so it's real temperature measurements, not proxies. So we're fairly confident that this is accurate. And this curve is sometimes known as the hockey stick, as you can see from the shape. I can see why it's called this being the handle. That's right. And that being the business yes. end. <laughs> But it's a massive change, Joe, between what's happened over here. Even if you project the medieval warm period here over to here, it's, it's nothing like as, it's as warm a, as it is. Yes. That's massive. Much compared. warmer than anything over the past 1,000 years. But then, if you just excuse me, the, the blue line, was anything equally dramatic going on with the volcanoes and sun activity line? 
Well, we asked the computer to um, tell us that, and this is what it comes up with. Mm -hmm. And you can see there's some large wiggles, and it's going up in the middle of the 20th century. But by the time you get to the year 2000, there's a large difference between the prediction and the actual measurements. Mm -hmm. So it looks like that the solar and volcanic factors can't reproduce that warming over that period. So uh, what we do then is we have to include uh, greenhouse gases. And if we put greenhouse gases along with the solar and volcanic forcing into the model, this is what it comes up with. And you can see we've got a warming over that, that 150 year period, which is roughly similar to the ob observations. So we think that by including the greenhouse gases, we can actually explain this warming. The green line is our activity, greenhouse gases. And it's not until you put the greenhouse gases in that you make sense of this massive increase in temperature. That's right. The, the natural factors can't produce that warming. It's only when we introduce the human factors that the warming can be explained. Wow. You can actually see the point when greenhouse gases start to take over from the natural cycles of climate change. It was the dawn of industrialization. When you see evidence like that, you really have to believe in man-made global warming. Which makes me wonder, what happens next? I can't see any sign that we're going to stop pumping greenhouse gases into the atmosphere anytime soon. So temperatures are surely going to carry on going up. But how much will they rise? And what will that mean for the world? What changes will it bring? It reminds me again of the retreating glacier I saw in Greenland. Could that be just a foretaste of what global warming will mean in the near future? I've recently heard from some former colleagues of mine that something similarly dramatic is happening near the South Pole. So I've arranged to meet an old mate of mine, Dave Vaughan who I know from the days when I ran a research station in Antarctica. Yeah, I'm really well. Good to see you. Dave has studied what's been happening in a particular area of Antarctica called the peninsula. So Dave, what can you tell me about the ice in Antarctica? You know, signs of change and things like that. The area that we, we know is changing as a result of climate, as it's changing in the last 10 years, is the Antarctic Peninsula. Of course, that's the area you know well. Yes. We know that you know, the records of temperature change for 50 years say it's warming at something like five times the rate of the globe as a whole, the global mean warming. Hmm. So this is an area that's really doing something quite extraordinary. Remember Sheldon Glacier? I worked on the Sheldon Glacier. I've uh, got an image of the geology of project, yeah. The front of the glacier is retreated and all the time you were there, and since the 1950s, in fact, the glacier front mm. was about here. Yes, OK. And that's why all those lines are there. Right. After 1970s, 1990, coming back into the late 90s and the year 2000, yeah. the glacier retreated at a hell of a rate. Wow. And now the, the, the front of the glacier, where the, the icebergs are being formed, is way back here, about five kilometres. Blimey, I was just going to say, that's five, five k. Yeah, yeah. There's about almost 300 glaciers down that coast, but 85% of them are actually retreating. 85%? Yeah, a few are doing other things, but basically 85% are oh, retreating, wow. and that's, that's a very strong signal. Mm. Oh, that's amazing. And that's not all. Many of the huge floating shelves of ice that surround the peninsula have simply collapsed. They've been going for a long time. Those final collapses were you know, very dramatic. And now, of course, we've had to redraw the map. Oh, yeah. This is the, this is the new map we've used, and all yeah. of those ice shelves are now open water. Big areas, you know, size of English counties amazing. of ice shelf are now open water, and we, we've amazing. taken ships in here for the first time. Oh, you have? Yeah. Well, one, oh. of the, one of the amazing things is that we've taken sediment samples from the seabed beneath where that ice shelf was. Brilliant. And we can now tell you that that ice shelf has been there for 10,000 years. This is a climate response, and it means that climate hasn't been this warm in the last 10,000 years. It seems like a real wake-up call to me. This part of Antarctica is already changing fast as temperatures rise. 